This podcast is for informational and educational purposes only and is not to be considered medical advice for any particular patient. Clinicians must rely on their own informed clinical judgments when making recommendations for their patients. Patients in need of medical advice should consult their personal health care provider. From UPMC Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh, welcome to That's Pediatrics. I'm your host, John Williams, from the Division of Pediatric Infectious Diseases. And I'm Steph Dewar, Residency Program Director and a member of the Hospitalist Division. And we are delighted to welcome our guest today, Dr. Scott Canna. Dr. Canna is a board-certified pediatric rheumatologist. He sees children with general pediatric rheumatology diseases and inflammatory diseases uh, in the outpatient clinic of the Division of Rheumatology at UPMC Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh. Uh, his research focuses on auto-inflammation and advancing both the science and clinical practice of immune dysregulation. Scott, welcome to That's Pediatrics. Thanks very much for having me. Well, we're excited to have you here today and to hear about the types of patients that you're caring for and the types of science that you're doing here at Children's. Uh, I've been here for about two years, um, and uh, the reason I bring that up is because the types of patients I see uh, were greatly informed by where I came from, and so I was at the NIH for four years before uh, coming here, seeing these patients with uh, what we call auto-inflammatory diseases. And it's a little bit of a, a category of exclusion. So first, I, I like to put people on the spot. So name a disease that you care for where inflammation is not one of the major, most important things that is driving that disease. Oh, that's such a great question. Let's think about that now. Where it's inflammation is not one not. of the major. Um, oh, traumatic I'm... brain injury. Oh, that's definitely way wrong. Trauma, that you release all these uh, damage associated with molecular patterns. Yeah, I think that you're throwing yourself under the bus there. So... Uh, I'm an infectious disease doctor, so I'm just going to so give up right now everything. and say, yeah. I think for me, it's all inflammation. So I like to tell every other specialist that what they like best about their job is every day at my job. Uh, <laughs> so we study inflammation. Um, so obviously, if you're infected, if you've had trauma, even if you have cancer or, or uh, you know, practically every other situation in the hospital from asthma even to, to you know, uh, after the acute phase of epilepsy, Inflammation is a major part of the problem. Um, so we try to go, the other part of the problem is that inflammation is really complex. Uh, and, and sort of the best example of that is the fact that we don't usually go after the inflammatory part of a lot of the diseases that we treat because we don't understand it very well. You know, it's 2018 and we're still giving lots of steroids for asthma. Um, can we do better? Sure, but it's complex. So uh, in, in the around the, the, the turn of the century, there was uh, this sort of correlation of learning more about basic inflammation and, and having the genetic tools to figure out the underlying causes for some rare inflammatory diseases. Uh, the first of these was called familial Mediterranean fever, or FMF, and we figured out the gene for that. And, and that explained a little bit of what was causing that disease. And what was causing that disease wasn't infection, it wasn't cancer, it wasn't trauma. Uh, and it wasn't classical autoimmunity where we think of like autoantibodies and, and uh, loss of tolerance to T cells. It was actually sort of a hyperactivation of our inflammatory system, our innate immune system. And so that spawned this whole field of autoinflammation. And so, you know, the bread and butter of, of the research that I've done since like 2005 has been trying to connect the dots between some of these genetic diseases that, that we've discovered in these patients and then why they get sick and how they get sick. And that's been really interesting in understanding human biology in those rare patients, but it's also had a lot of sort of spreading effects into how we understand inflammation in practically every patient that comes into the clinic. So that is such an interesting thing that you said about steroids and asthma. As somebody who went to medical school several decades ago, um, you know, I know that we know way more about inflammatory response these days, but the truth of the matter is when I give patients with asthma systemic steroids, they improve. And also when I give them a controller, which is an inhaled daily steroid, they tend to have less acute episodes. So how does what you're talking about translate to what I'm doing? Because I feel as though sometimes our body's natural response of inflammation 
actually makes us a little worse. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, as as probably one of the, the biggest purveyors of uh, steroids in the hospital, rheumatologists love to use steroids, but it's a bit of a blunt instrument. Um, and so absolutely, asthma is, is an inflammatory disease, and I don't think anybody uh, would disagree with that. Uh, but, you know, what do we mean by inflammation and can we do something better than steroids? And certainly lots and lots of very bright people uh, at this institution and elsewhere are, are, are trying. Uh, but it's been a tough nut to crack because inflammation is so complex. But those same patients that you're giving all those steroids to, they get infections because the blunt instrument of steroids is immunosuppressive. They don't grow very well because steroids have all kinds of awful side effects. And so can we do better? Absolutely. And in fact, you know, there's a lot on the hot horizon. I don't want to spend this whole time talking about asthma. Um, but just as an example of a disease that every one of us has treated a thousand times, where our immunologic understanding of it in the lab is seems to be way beyond what we're doing in the clinic uh, in a targeted fashion. And that's where some of these genetic insights have been really helpful in not just narrowing down the pathology, but sort of pointing with a big sort of uh, 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 blinking you know, uh, finger to say, like, this is the place where you want to intervene. That's the place where you're going to fix all of this. So you mentioned, Scott, and I want to hear in a second about what blinking arrows you've been seeing and following, but you really highlighted the difference between a classic autoimmune disease where the adaptive immune system, T cells, B cells, et cetera, attack tissues like lupus or, you know, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, and what you're calling innate, you know, problems with the innate immune system. Are there a lot of diseases in that bucket, and do they collectively sort of add up to a, to a lot of suffering in kids? Uh, yeah. Uh, absolutely. So, um, you know, I think um, any any distinction that you make in immunology is kind of arbitrary by definition because all of these systems interact. But the the current best way that we parse the immune system's response is between innate and adaptive immunity. And innate immunity is sort of the, the more ancient version of our immune system. And that includes things like barriers like our skin and our gut and some of the things that our skin and our gut make to keep those barriers intact. And then the really rapid, often uh, really robust, but often really damaging inflammatory responses that happen really quick, uh, but not in a very uh, adaptive way. They, they don't tailor themselves to one specific antigen or one specific bug. Um, so, you know, among the more common diseases, you know, I, I would say that any disease where there's a substantial amount of inflammation, where we don't think that it's an autoimmune disease, probably has a pretty big autoinflammatory component. Um, you know, probably the most uh, accessible one is gout, uh, where gout is this massive inflammatory response to these weird crystals. And we now know that those crystals trickle to trigger this innate immune complex called the NLRP3 inflammasome. Uh, and because of the diseases that are associated with the NLRP3 inflammasome, that pointed to this one very specific molecule called IL-1. And if you block IL-1 in patients that have a, a mutation in LRP3, it's magical. And if you block IL-1 in gout, it's pretty magical. Uh, it's not first line treatment because it's also pretty expensive. Uh, and you'd like to prevent gout episodes by preventing what triggers that innate immune attack. But uh, you know, I would say this sort of disease burden of autoinflammation writ large is, is really broad. Obviously, the disease burden of these really rare genetic diseases is not, you know, uh, super broad. But the things that they teach us and the mechanisms that they point out, as I said, are, are pretty broad. So can you talk to us a little bit about the research that you're involved with here at Children's? Sure. I would love to. So uh, I love my job. I, I get to come into lab and, uh, you know, we try to ask really important, interesting and hard questions every day and use the best tools that we can. Uh, luckily, we're in a place like Pittsburgh where all those tools are available to us uh, to answer those questions in a way that's clinically meaningful. And so that, to me, that's sort of how I define translational research is that the experiments that you do day in and day out are, are guided by things that are clinically meaningful. And so, you know, that, that, that's a little bit broad, but that's kind of where we, we bring it in. So um, I've been interested in autoinflammatory diseases for a very long time. Uh, and then when I did my fellowship, uh, I got really interested in some of diseases that weren't clearly autoinflammatory that looked 
kind of like sepsis, only without the infection. Mm -hmm. So patients who were just unbelievably ill in our intensive care unit, uh, what we might call hyperinflammatory, often they have really high serum ferritin levels, so sometimes they get called hyperferritinemic. Um, and what was kind of conspicuous is that we have been following what started as a few and are now dozens of genetic autoinflammatory diseases. And by and large, when you looked across all of these people who we knew had a, a genetically encoded increase in their innate immune system, they didn't get septic. Uh, they didn't get this sort of systemic inflammatory phenotype that ended up in the ICU. Um, and so, so I got interested in, in a, a disease that we see in rheumatology uh, called macrophage activation syndrome, which is just one of the names we give to this hyperinflammation uh, phenotype. Uh, and uh, while I was at the NIH, we started bringing in some of these patients and, and doing what we do, the genetics on them. Uh, and we found, lo and behold, a, a genetic mutation uh, in a gene called NLRC4, which is also a driver of this inflammasome. And, and it, was, you know, uh, it, was, it was kind of a big deal because this was the first uh, known sort of auto-inflammatory genetic cause of something that looked like a hyper-inflammatory sepsis. So... Um, What's really great about uh, working in the auto-inflammatory field is that everybody wants to use the work of everyone else mm -hmm. to, to try and understand why, what makes diseases different. And so because I'd been studying inflammasome problems for so long, we were able to compare these new patients with this NLRC4 problem uh, with other patients that we knew had inflammasome problems but had a totally different phenotype, at least, you know, to people who, who look only at inflammation. Um, and what really stood out was this other molecule called interleukin-18 or IL-18. And so that has become uh, one of the cornerstones of what our lab works on now, is trying to understand what's unique about IL-18 and why does it seem to predispose people to this really horrible uh, uh, phenotype called macrophage activation syndrome. So some patients, all of these are patients who have mutations uh, in these innate immune responses, but it sounds like what you're saying is only a subset developed this severe systemic overwhelming inflammation, and that's mainly driven by IL-18? Yeah. So we think that IL-18 is one of the mechanisms, um, you know, because of genetic work that was done, you know, long before I got into science. We, we know another mechanism actually has to do with, with killer cell function. So part of our immune system includes these killer cells. We have natural killer cells, and we have cytotoxic T cells. Uh, and they're called killers because they kill through this granule mediated process. And so if you're not, if you have a genetic problem in killing, you get a very similar phenotype. Uh, and so we're trying to actually, this is one of the projects we're working very closely on right now is figure out how do you get to this same horrible systemic inflammatory phenotype from these two very different mechanisms of, of killing problems uh, or excess IL-18? Is it all one thing that converges somewhere upstream of that disease? Uh, or do they get there from totally different mechanisms? Uh, and the relevance here is that IL-18 and, and killer cell function are things that are variable in the population in general. And so just because we use these genetic diseases as kind of what I'll call like inflammatory archetypes, you know, they define a very pure and very sort of clean mechanism of disease. But that tells you what kinds of mechanisms you should be looking in patients where you don't have a genetic cause. Uh, and that's where we've tried to build in uh, a lot of biomarker discovery to say, what are the biomarkers of our inflammatory archetypes? And then how do they function, those biomarkers? What do they look like in you know, our patients who we don't have any genetic reason to think that they have a disease? So what I think I hear you saying is pursuing this line of inquiry could potentially allow us to better understand what child is more at risk for this type of response and potentially intervene and prevent that? Absolutely. And, and, and I mean, we've been doing this since, you know, since the beginning of things. When, so when we first found some of these auto-inflammatory diseases uh, and, and we saw this dramatic response of blocking IL-1 in those inflammatory diseases, we said, well, we have a whole bunch of other patients we don't know what their genetic problems are, but because of their clinical description or because of these biomarkers, they look similar to these genetic patients. Let's try blocking IL-1 in them, and bam, it's been you know revolutionary. 
And so now we're blocking IL-1 in, in all kinds of diseases that we wouldn't necessarily have ever gotten to if we hadn't studied these rare genetic diseases so closely. And so we're doing the same thing now with IL-18 in sort of a, a later generation. Are, are there unintended consequences? It seems as though this is a body's response. Are you modulating it or shutting it down? So, of course, I have a response to this. Um, <laughs> an inflammatory response? An in well, <laughs> depending on who you ask, all of my responses are inflammatory. Uh, so, um, you know, I, I think that there are, th again, like not to get too out in space here, but, but this is what I try to tell the residents to get them excited. There are three main, you know, we're biologists, basically, functional biologists. Uh, there are three main drivers of evolution in my mind. One is um, sort of uh, food, you got to eat. Uh, one is reproduction, say no more. Uh, and then one is host defense. And host defense comes from, you know, defending yourself from, from you know, predatory animals like saber-toothed cats. You got to be able to run, and you got to be able to see your environment. Uh, but you also need to defend yourself against bugs and pathogens. And so no self-respecting multicellular organism only has one way of fighting off a bug. Uh, but when things go wrong, either genetically or in our clinic, it's usually not everything gone wrong. It's usually one or maybe just a couple things. And so I think that helps explain why we seem to get away with blocking specific things. And the side effects we see from blocking what we thought were just these linchpin you know, cytokines or, or mediators, we get away with it. And this is why you turn on your TV and you see, you know, all these commercials for TNF blockers. And now you're seeing, you know, we've, psoriasis is practically a solved problem now uh, because there's all these different targeted therapies. Now, do these therapies have side effects? Of course. Are those side effects as bad as steroids? No. We're, we're using them in place of steroids because they're much more uh, well tolerated. They're less immunosuppressive. Uh, and they have fewer off-target effects. Now, of course, we're still learning about all of them and they're coming, you know, the pipeline is just dropping new drugs constantly. So that's a challenge for, for everyone. And one of the reasons that um, I think that a, a working knowledge of immunology is certainly fundamental for my specialty, but I think actually, unfortunately, a working knowledge of immunology is gonna become a really an essential piece of every, every part of medical training because every doctor uses steroids right now and every doctor knows they probably could do better. And so what are they gonna do better with? Well, it depends on the disease. And that means you've gotta know that, you know, the IL-4 and IL-13 signaling pathway converges on the same receptor and there's a drug for that now. And it works great in atopic disease. Um, so, so I think we get away with it because these drugs are targeted and because the immune system those things redundantly. Otherwise, we wouldn't have evolved. So we're all pediatricians. We take care of human patients, of children. Um, but, you know, with your research, you um, have worked both with doing human research and in animal models. So could you talk a little bit about, you know, what you learned from each of those and why you use both? Uh, absolutely. Um, so obviously, as I said before, every experiment we do, we try to make it you know, clinically relevant. Um, but there's just so many really important questions that can't be asked in people for obvious logistical or ethical reasons. Um, and, you know, so if you want to know if blocking pathway X is effective in this patient population, you know, that is a very large undertaking in people. You have to put together a big enough cohort you have to get regulatory approval. You have to have the safety information about the drug. That's to do one experiment that may or may not work. And so we use model systems, not only animals, but cell lines, what, you know, as, as uh, the best systems that we can, you know, that are the least uh, invasive. And, 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 you know, of course, we do everything under the, the, the supervision of, of our IACUC and as humanely as possible. Um, but, you know, if you want to answer some of these questions so that you can move on, um, these model systems give you a way of not just doing that experiment, but also looking at why and how things are happening. Because maybe you thought drug X was going to work great and it didn't. And now you can interrogate that system and you can look at 
you know, what cells were there? I thought it was going to be, you know, this big Treg expansion, but now there's all these Th17 cells there. You know, we, we have tools to interrogate this. And the other part is that I've made a, a lot about talking and studying humans with, with genetic mutations. And, and I maintain that that is incredibly valuable. Uh, but, you know, especially in model systems and especially in mice, there are genetic tools far beyond what you could ever find in people and in a much more controlled way so you can actually learn something. Um, and so taking advantage of some of those genetic tools is, is a, a huge sort of leap forward. And then finally, you know, there's just so much complexity to these inflammatory and immunologic systems that trying to boil everything down to a Petri dish, you're just missing too many variables. So it's really important, at least for the work we do, to be able to study a whole organism. Because a lot of our outcomes and our, our studies are kind of clinical outcomes. We have, we have a CBC machine in my lab. We do blood counts in our animals all the time to find out, you know, did we improve their anemia or did we, you know, things like that. This has been fascinating. Um, as somebody who remembers a bit about immunology from oh so long ago, um, it is amazing how much we continue to learn, and obviously there's still a lot for us to learn out there. I really appreciate you explaining a lot of this to us. It uh, gave me a little bit of um, tense remembrances back to medical school, but this has been illuminating. So you're going to open up your immunology text tonight? I might. <laughs> <laughs> well, and it's really fascinating because I think it's one of the areas of clinical medicine that we practice. Like you, Steph, I, I, I remember when basically all we had was steroids, and then we started using IVIG as the steroid of the 90s. In fact, it was called that, steroid of the 90s, because it was good for every inflammatory disease, except for those that it wasn't. And uh, so it's really been remarkable to see in our career, you know, these much more specific targeted mm -hmm. tools and treatments become available through this really sort of basic work. And I mean, if you're paying attention, you know, the, the basically the, the most recent Nobel Prize was for cancer immunotherapy. And that's basically awarding the cancer doctors for discovering that the immune system was there and was probably pretty good for treating cancer. Uh, which people like Jim Allison have been trumpeting for decades. And it turns out like, yeah, this is a really big deal. Uh, so I don't think, I think, uh, as we alluded to at the very beginning, inflammation is important in every disease process. And so whether you like it or not, if you're treating patients, you're manipulating their immune system. And because we have all these tools, uh, you know, you're going to have patients in your clinic, whether you're treating them or not, that are on drugs you've never heard of and using mechanisms that you, you're gonna to have to go back to your text. So it's, it's, it's what I call a living knowledge. You have to have to sort of this living appreciation, and this includes me. I mean, I Google image search pathways every, like 10 times a day <laughs> because I forgot how, you know, SRC signals or, you know, what is sick phosphorylate again, you know. So thanks so much for joining us. I really appreciate you taking the time to chat with us today. Thanks for having me. Scott, it's been a pleasure to have you. Thanks to everyone for listening, and we'll uh, speak to you next time on That's Pediatrics.